safe streets, vibrant neighborhoods, successful business and commerce. These are things that make a healthy community. We are a diverse community, rural, suburban, urban, a multitude of languages and ethnicities, ages and experiences. We are a collaborative community. Public-private partnerships make us a model community that others want to follow. It is what makes us unique. It is what makes us strong. The employees of Kent County reflect our diversity and seek to serve our communities. People in this county, in this area, we wrap our arms around each other. We come together to collaborate, to solve problems. Um, we're all working for the good of the whole. And I think that's wonderful. And you can see it. You can see it as you drive around Kent County. Our impact starts the day a baby is born and a birth certificate is issued, to protecting children from deadly diseases through vaccination, to the public safety and justice provided by law enforcement and the courts, to offering veteran services and caring for the elderly. Every day we work to keep our communities robust. I think if you are somebody who is interested in serving your community, in building a strong knowledge base and a good group of people to work with, then the county is one of your best employment opportunities out there. It's been completely rewarding in every way I could possibly explain for 26 years and I feel like I grow every single day still today. Leading these dedicated employees are 19 member board of commissioners and our county administrator controller, along with our elected officials and appointed department directors, placing emphasis on civic involvement, quality housing, vibrant neighborhoods, and strong, solid infrastructure to allow businesses to thrive. Professional, dedicated, collaborative, and innovative. Behind the scenes, collaboration between foundations, charitable organizations, nonprofits, for-profit businesses, public sector demonstrated through the county, the city of Grand Rapids, the townships, all the cities and the villages in our area. If we don't come together, then we will not have the strength that we have today, and I only hope to build upon that. Our aim is to make our communities the best they can be. We are involved in exciting development projects, sustainable recycling programs, and creative progressive prevention programming. We partner with elected officials, impacting policy ideas that become great achievements. We seek opportunities to reach out into the community and offer our services to help our residents make Kent County thrive. Our relationship um, is solid, um, both from a staff standpoint at the county level, as well as the Board of Commissioners. And um, they understand what we do and the benefits that we can do for the community, and vice versa, we couldn't do what we do without the help of Kent County. While most of us are busy running our lives, Kent County's elected officials, administrator controller, and over 1,600 employees are serving the communities where we live our lives so we can all have a place we are proud to call home. Kent County, it's life well run. All right, we better get started here. I wanna welcome everybody to the Thursday, May 23rd Board of Commissioners meeting. It's sunny and not raining anymore, so that's a good thing. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioners Antor, Brevey, here. Volkowski, here. Hennessy, here. Jones, here. Coleman, here. Melton, present. Morgan, here. Ponstein, here. Salfeld, here. Skaggs, Sparks, present. Vice Chair Steck. Here. Commissioners Talon. Here. Bonk. Here. Voorhees. Present. Womack. Wooden. Here. Chair Bolter. Here. Madam Chair, you have 15 <coughs> members present. Four absent. You have a quorum. Thank you. Call on Commissioner Voorhees for the invocation. Madam Chair, is this three minute timer on me now as well? or? Oh, I only get two. It's not Sunday, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I was thinking of today's invocation and why we come together as this layer in law, uh, of government at the county level uh, and all government, why do we come together? And the word love is what stood out in my mind. 
We want a society where love can be transmitted to one another and the purposes and the plans of love can be known. And so we want orderly government, we want orderly society, and that's where we have government. And that's why I think the motivating factor why we come together is that we can have in Kent County a high quality of life where love can be shared and, and really be enjoyed together uh, as we live together. And that's why we spend the time we, and the money we do with the sheriff's office, uh, law enforcement. Why do we want that? Because we want a peaceful society. Why do we have a health department? Because we don't want to see people sick. Why do we have all of the services that we in government in the county? Why do we do it? Because we want a healthy, uh, prosperous, good life in our community. And that is an expression of love. That's what love is all about. Now, as we go into this weekend, uh, the memorial, uh, 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 Monday is the memorial day, uh, um, what greater love that one would lay down their life for another. And we have men and women over the years have laid down their life so that we can have a society where love can be expressed and where uh, we can have a, a, a joyful life, a quality of life, a better life. And so as we think of love, Think of our part in, in bringing this forward more and more in our society, in our quality of life. Let's uh, look to the one who is the source of love, our God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again this morning we come as your servants uh, to minister love one to another and to uh, care for one another. And so we thank you for love and for all that the, the power uh, that love is in in blessing lives and raising the quality of life for people. And so we thank you uh, that we as commissioners uh, can come here in, in, in peace and in a, uh, a time of real prosperity and that we can minister one to another and be a blessing. So thank you for each and every one of our fellow commissioners, Lord, and uh, be with those families who will be um, uh, this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, will be thinking of their loved ones that gave that ultimate sacrifice. And they will be uh, gathering together, many of us with families, and may we just uh, so enjoy and have a thankful heart uh, of this Memorial Day weekend. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Let us pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good job, Commissioner. Thank you. Love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're on to item five, special order of business, and we will bring up uh, Steve Duarte to give us a financial overview. And while Steve's coming up here, I had the pleasure of watching him in action in New York this year, and it's like watching, you know, Rembrandt paint. <laughs> he's he's, uh, he's quite, quite the fiscal artist, so. You know what that's like? <laughs> I don't. I'm not that old, but um, anyway. Good morning, commissioners. You all should have a copy of the uh, financial overview. Um, as you all should know, we, we go annually to uh, New York in April and meet with the rating agencies. Once again this year, they rated our short-term notes and SP1 Plus from Standard & Poor's, a MIG-1 from uh, Moody's, both the highest you can get. We also had our long-term rate reaffirmed AAA by both agencies. Um, Happy to be able to report that back. The financial overview is a significant portion of what we present to the rating agencies. Um, all the data in this report is, is as of March 31, 2019. I will tell you, in fact, some of this data has already changed, but it was the best that we had at the time we prepared this for New York. The rating agencies are interested in a broad range of information. Some examples are property tax, population trends, per capita income, employment, liquidity of the county, financial policies, 
and their adherence to those financial policies. That's just some examples of the things that are very important to them. So I'm going to walk you through a high-level overview of this. In, in New York, it takes about 45 minutes, but we get into a lot more detail, and plus they have questions about going on. So we're going to go with a, a high-level, uh, hopefully a much more abbreviated uh, presentation for you folks. If you would turn to page 12, please. Page 12 is the labor force distribution by, by industry, and it shows the labor force growth between 2014 and 2018. The point I made in New York is that with almost, without exception, we had growth in all areas for four consecutive years. Some of the highlights, manufacturing, grew by 13,200 jobs, or 12.5%. Education and health services, 9,700 jobs, 11.4%. Uh, leisure and hospitality, 6,600 jobs, 14.7%. Mining, logging, construction, 6,800 jobs, or 34%. Bottom line, Total non-farm employment grew by 49,700 jobs, or 9.5%. If you would turn to page 15. Obviously, one of the things we're very uh, interested in is our SEV and our taxable value. If we start talking about state equalized taxable value, uh, they like to talk about a term called full value SEV, which is your SEV multiplied by two to take it to full value. Ours is slightly over $59 billion now. They also like to talk about the full value per capita. That's taking that $59 billion and divided by the most recent uh, estimate of population for us, it was 2017, was 6, 648594 So the per capita full value was 90972 Good, not the best they see in AAAs, but it was very, very good. Moving down to the table in the middle of the page, we talk about SEV and taxable value history. If you look at the fourth column, it talks about the SEV change from the prior year. In 2018, we experienced a 4.7% growth in SEV, and in 2019, we experienced 8.7% in the growth in SEV. If you move one column over to the right, the one that produces the money is the taxable value. In 2018, we had a 4.8% growth. In 2019, 5.81%. Best we've seen in years for Kent County. I would note that we bottomed out in 2013. In 2013, SEV went up 0%. And then a taxable value actually went down a negative one-tenth of a percent. So since then, we have experienced six years of, of taxable value growth, which has been good for us. The other thing that we like to talk about is the property tax growth margin. How much can taxable value rise before it, it tops out at SEV? Um, in this case, you take the taxable value and divide it by the SEV, and we have a growth margin now of about 17.91%. And you can see that graphically in that graph that appears at the bottom. You have the comparison of taxable value to, to SEV, and then that green line is the percentage of uh, taxable value to uh, SEV, and you, as you can see, it's at that 17.91%. We can grow quite a ways before we hit that bump. Any questions about taxable value? I would say that over the next few years, we're expecting taxable value in SEV to continue to grow 
expectations for SEV or in the six to eight percent range. Taxable value was in the four to six percent range. Turn to page 20, excuse me, 18. Since we're selling notes on delinquent taxes, they like to know how much you're collecting and how fast you're collecting them. So if you look at this table, the property tax collection history, if you look at the third column, it has collections to the March 1st of the following, the year following the levy. Uh, in 2017, we collected 93.81%. In 2018, we collect, uh, of the 2018 levy, we collected 93.41. The message that we always deliver is we are consistently around 93 to 94% collection by, my, by March 1. The next most important thing is what it looks, what's it look like? in subsequent years, particularly that first year after the, uh, the levy. Um, collections to March 1 of 2019, uh, the 2017 one is now at 99.67%. And of course, the 2018 one doesn't change because it's the same date that I gave you before but I would expect it to be in a 99% or 93% range, 99% range, excuse me. We are consistently around 99% one year hence. Any questions on that? Now we can turn to page 20. On page 20 we have uh, a couple of interesting tables. At the top, we talk about the constitutional debt limit. And the constitutional debt limit is 10% of USEV. For us, that's $29.5 $20, billion. So that would say that we could issue up to $2.95 <laughs> billion of debt which staggers even me because I work with big numbers and I, I don't understand that, but that is our limit. Currently, we're a little more conservative than that. We're at $333 million. So the margin of additional debt that could be levied is $2.62 billion. And debt outstanding as a percentage of SEV for us right now is 1.1%. Yes. How, how does that, excuse me, I just had to adjust those up a little bit. The 1.1% in terms of what we have outstanding would be considered moderate debt by most. It's, it's, it's not considered heavy debt at this point. Yeah, but it's been consistently going down, right? Because I remember so it at 1.8%. It will keep going down. We'll go to another table. We actually have, we have a, 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 in 10 years, we'll have like uh, a major point, 60% of our debt paid. I'll cover that in just a second. But yes, it will go down unless we issue additional debt. Any other questions about that? Nope. Sorry. Move down to the debt statement. And I like to do about the middle of the table there, just above overlapping debt, it says total direct debt. The gross debt we have outstanding obviously matches the $333 million we just talked about. That's how much we have outstanding. If you look down the left side of that, you'll see what that outstanding debt is for. If you look at the next column, we talk about self-supporting debt. That would be like enterprise funds, uh, drain loans, things like that that have their own source of revenue that we're not paying directly from the general fund unless somebody should fail to make their debt service payment. We do have our full, full faith and credit behind almost all our debt. There's only one issue we don't, and that's the $3 million CIB bonds that we have. 
So we have $191 million of self-supporting debt. That leaves net debt that we're supporting of about $141.9 million. The per capita for us is about $218.89 for the direct debt. It's about a half a percent. If you look down one more just to get a kind of a feel for it, total direct and overlapping debt to see what our taxpayers, because we share the same taxpayers, what our taxpayers are responsible for, you will see the per capita is about $2,700, and the uh, percentage of SCB is about 5.9%. Any questions on that? Commissioner Talon. Thank you, Chairs. Steve, the um, county city building authority bonds, I'm assuming that's for uh, the convention center, is that correct? We have convention center bonds would be the joint building authority. So if you look, uh, county city building authority uh, looks like we're 30, about $34 right. million. Dollars of it. So why is that considered not self-supporting? Because... You know, I tried to show that as self-supporting, okay? But they argued with me in Wall Street and said, no, we, we won't do that. And I think the primary reason for that is a couple of years we had to step up and make yeah. that payment from the general fund. So they didn't feel like it was 100% support by that. But isn't that the basic premise of, of these other ones as well, that if they're not paid by the whatever that other entity is, that the county ends up having to pay, using our full faith and credit, we, we have to back those up? We so do it back seems odd time. that and we put they pick in, on that one. Over the years, we put in about $7 million from general fund to cover $7.1 million. We are now in the process of trying to return that back to the general fund as we should. Thank you. Going to the next table on page 21. This is a debt amortization schedule, again, as of March 31, 2019. What they like to look at is how much of your debt are you going to retire over the next 10 years. So in the year 2028, by that point in time, we will have retired, if, unless we issue more debt, 69.21% of our debt will be gone in 10 years. That's about $230,700,000 of debt retirement that we will have done in 10 years. If we go to page 25, I can tell you for a fact two things that they worry about a lot. Your pension liability and your OPEB liability, okay? Kent County continues to remain in strong position, but I go over it with them every year. They even have their own way of breaking it down. They look at it a little different than we do, uh, a little more critical but I wanted to cover how this appears in our financial statement. There's a table at the bottom of the, of the page 25, and it balances at 12-31-2017. Uh, our total pension liability at that point was 859986000 or just under $860 million. Our planned fiduciary net position our ability to pay our cash was almost $897 million. And that our net pension liability was a negative $36.9 or $37 million. In this case, you want to see that negative because what that means is we're overfunded. We're overfunded for the financial statement presentation, which is different than your actual world valuation. We're overfunded 104.3%. And if you actually go out on CAFR, you will see an asset book. The GASB 34 government-wide statements now show an asset right now of about $37 million. That can change overnight. The difference between the two statements is that we use market value for what appears in the GASB 34 statements. Okay. For valuing the pension and the contribution, 
you use the smooth value or valuation assets, they like to call it, which can be both higher or lower than your market value because we smooth them over four years. At the present time, the market value for this one was higher than your asset valuation. Therefore, you had a, a little underfunding when you look at your actuarial report, but you had an overfunding when you look at your financial statements. Does that make sense? Yep. Any other questions on that? Questions on the pension? Nope. Keep we going. We turn to page 29. We've got a similar statement at the bottom, and this one deals with OPEP, mm -hmm. primarily post-retirement health care, okay? The balance is at uh, December 31, 2017. Total OPEP liability is 58.7 million. Plan fiduciary net position, 23, um, 25.3 million. And net OPEP liability is 33 4 million. Okay, we are not at 100% funding. That's not a problem with them. Everybody has this problem. What they're looking for is do you have a plan to deal with it? We have a solid plan to deal with it, and we have, we have been dealing with it. We started dealing with this issue from a funding point of view in 2007. Uh, so from a total liability, 33 million sounds like a lot of money, it is a lot of money to me, but from an OPEB liability, it's, it's nothing. It's really nothing. We have communities with hundreds of millions worth, worth of liability. Commissioner Morgan. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. On, on the OPEB, Steve, uh, we've had that program in place since 2007. Yep. Uh, and you say, are we still, is that on track? to? Because we were giving, uh, I think, a million dollars to that to start paying it down. So um, is we, that something we should be looking at to maybe accelerate or get it back on the front burner? To, we, this is extremely low, and I'm very proud of the fact that we, we, are, we don't we, have this liability. But I'm going to cover your question with about four different answers because they're all tied together, okay? First of all... Um, we're setting aside that money each year. We're putting in the full amount plus a little by the way we do it. We're funding both the implicit subsidy and the cash subsidy. So you could split that and, and count it as, as one, but we're actually putting it in. And what that will allow us to do when we get fully funded is to go back to a split payment so that you're not overfunding constantly. But right now, we put in about 3.5% of payroll. Again, for most communities, that doesn't even, that's nothing. That's nothing. I see communities that are have to put in 30, 35% of their general fund revenues just to fund their pension and their OPEB line. Yeah, we, I never want to see that in Kent County, and we won't. I think that uh, we have always made our actual contribution. We were now up to uh, funding the, both the implicit and the cash subsidy. But we also had an experience study this year that said, okay, you make certain assumptions and you put your contribution based on those assumptions. If you don't hit those assumptions right on, you can be above or below. We went in on the, and the recommendation and pretty much in sync with the retirement board and made some changes. We're saying long-term investment rates, probably as they look at it now, are not supportable in the 7 and 8% range anymore, okay? So we have lowered our uh, pension assumption and our OPEB assumption to 6.75, okay? That is conservative. That made New York smile because they feel that's so reasonable. Their answer was anything <coughs> below 7 is is good. So at 6.75, we've done that. When we originally set up the plan, it was set up with a 30-year open amortization. We have went to a closed amortization period because the 30-year open means every year you look at it and you go for 30 again, 30 again. With the close, we say 25, 24, 23, and we, we go in and we slice and dice it that way. 
we are down to a 20, 22 year close in the OPEP and a 20 year close in, uh, in, the, in the pension fund. So we continue to shrink that down. We looked at other things to see if there was any impact that we needed. Well, mortality, are we ahead or behind mortality? Are we, you know, we know people are living longer. We adopted the uh, RP14, I think it was two years ago, about the same time to split off the airport. We adopted that. We're looking at that. We're probably doing a little better than what the amortization uh, schedule says, so we'll make an adjustment to that. But you go through all those. You do an experience study about every five years saying, this was our best guess going forward. Now we need to tweak it back and forth. I feel very good about where we set. We have a plan, we have a solid plan, and it is a reasonable but conservative plan. All right. If we could turn to page 36. Page 36 takes a look at our, our bargaining groups and where we're at with, with everybody in our employment group. One of the things they want to know is do you have good relations with your unions and your labor agreements? And two, what is the status of those? Are they overdue? Are you having labor under uh, strikes, et cetera? We, uh, we, we have said that our bargaining groups work very well with us and we are able to reach positive agreements for both sides with them. And so we demonstrate that by showing them in this. Six of these groups are signed agreements through the year 2023. The other ones are 2022. So now they know that we have in place stable employment, stable um, wage increases so that we can start to plan how we spend our money. We know where we're going to be. So they like to see that. I covered briefly with them that for 2019, 20, and 21, we have 2.5% wage increases forecasted in there. 22 and 23 have 2% but subject to wage openers, and, and we will deal with those when, when they come up. Uh, depending upon what the market conditions are, what, what, what it looks like in, uh, in taxes, how we're all doing, but we will have conversations for those. We uh, got the last group uh, signed up to start in 2020 to have a shared pension contribution up to 9.5%. Nobody's paying 9.5% right now, so that's... Uh, that's uh, Pretty much it with that, and uh, uh, unless you have questions, we'll move over to, to what will be my final page, and that's to touch briefly on uh, 2017 actuals, 18 budget actuals as we project them, and 2019 page. budget. Page. 30, 30. Um, yeah. 38. Focusing on the net revenue over expenditures at the bottom of the page, third line up. Uh, 2017 ended up with a $1.2 million surplus. Uh, the budget for 19 showed a deficit by the time we did transfers, but we didn't expect to have a deficit. We just then increased the, the revenue source because we knew we were going to be okay with lapses. The actual for 2018 is projected to be about $3.7 million, $3 million surplus. And for 2019, uh, we budgeted a $930,000 surplus. That's primarily because we know that as the budget grows, we need to generate surpluses. We're going to continue to comply with our fund balance policy. <coughs> And then unless you have some questions about the individual statements or anything you see there, that, uh, that pretty much concludes my presentation for today. All right. Questions for Steve. Commissioner Talon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Steve, um, following up on that, that last piece, can you tell us um, where we were at, recognizing that the 2018 actuals have not been audited yet? and they've changed a little bit. 
Where are we at in terms of our 40% minimum fun, fund balance on that 74.5 million there? That, if I'm are we understanding over, your question, that $3.7 million surplus will put us even with our fund balance policy. We'll be within about five to seven thousand dollars of what our policy is. I've done the calculation. I know the calculation pretty close. And it's going to be almost dead nuts. I think we're like $7,000 above what our policy is now. Last year, we were actually 742000 below. But the policy allows us a year to catch up, and we've done that. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Commissioner Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I think just the two takeaways is our balance sheet looks pretty healthy, and we're probably in a pretty good uh, financial position. Um, a lot of work goes into this, and I just want to emphasize uh, the work that the pension board does and uh, to keep that going. Uh, it's a lot of work. I've been on that board during downtimes, and it's nice to see that uh, we're 100% funded again. And it's just so important that uh, we just pay attention and have our due diligence. Okay. The last thing I'm going to say for I leave. Starting on page 49, you'll see our key financial policies that we share with, with the people in New York. And starting on page 61, you will see articles of important developments in Kent County. That gives them a broad view that, uh, mm -hmm. that maybe we're not the rust belt, that we really do have some good, <laughs> solid activities going. And thank you. Any, uh, Commissioner Voorhees. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Steve. Thanks for your work. Um, this uh, six million five hundred thousand um, appropriation laps does that go in counting in our fund balance policy or is that not included in those dollars fund balance laps for us is just a way of showing how many resources we need for for balancing the budget when it comes to fund balance it's, it's like i said at boot camp, and when I said the presentation the other day, revenues in increase it, expenditures out decrease it. So it's only the actuals that you have to worry about for fund balance. But does this six point five million include it in those things, or is that not part of the fund balance? It's <laughs> it's not per se, but because you didn't spend it, that means you didn't reduce fund balance by that six and a half million dollars. Okay, so we had a projection, but what we actually spent is what went into fund balance. It's all about actuals when you talk about fund balance. Any other questions for Steve? This could be his last presentation to us, so thank you so much, and we will You're be welcome. celebrating you. you later. All right, on to item B, Urban Rural Report, Matthew Van Zetten. I think you all have a copy in front of you, hard copy. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Happy to present the Urban County, uh, Urban Rural Report to you. Um, I want to take a quick moment to um, recognize a few people that were really instrumental in putting this together. Um, First of all, Jennifer Hedrick from the uh, management analyst with the administrator's office. She's been with the county six months now, and she uh, is a primary author and was supported by um, MB Ventil, Mary Beth Ventil, um, and then uh, Mike Fortman. Um, so uh, the three of them really worked diligently with all of our department directors and elected officials to get the data to, to put this together. Um, I want to take a quick moment and talk about the history of this report. Um, in 2006, um, there was a first report was done, and uh, Dar Boss, Matthew Van Zetten, and Jennifer DeHaan were the management analysts back then, and the three of us worked to uh, put this together um, in response to a request by uh, Daryl, our former administrator controller, because there was a lot of uh, discussion in the community about do urban um, communities get more, do rural communities get more or less about from tax county general fund tax dollars, and we started this report. Um, and we, and I think we did an okay job for a first iteration. A few years ago, um, there was another report that was put together, um, and uh, it was um, 
fine report, but um, as we went through it, um, we learned um, and took a deeper dive this year into, into the report. Um, and it really gets back to the data management plan. The county is really making an investment right now in data and how to do data management. Um, Jennifer has a, a background in data. Mike Fortman has a background in data. IT group is working with us. And we're really trying to break down silos of our databases so that we can do deeper analysis. Um, so this is the first iteration of something you'll see um, from that. Um, it's deeper than other reports. Um, we've really affirmed up to data and um, have taken a, a, a way that we can um, replicate it in the future much quicker and easier because we've built databases. Um, so it's repeatable. Uh, we've cited the data in the report um, so it's much clearer as to where the data is coming from. Um, and we really have taken a, a deep look at the property tax levy in this report um, deeper than we did in other reports. And that was vetted uh, with support from our Bureau of Equalization and Matt Wolford to help us really take a deeper dive into, into that taxable value. Um, I want to talk about, so the purpose of this then is to really examine the services that we provide by the county. Um, we're conducting an analysis of, who, of how those services are funded. And then we're starting to look at utilization rates of who uses the services that we provide here at the county. So, um, as you can see, we have 636,000 residents as of 2017. Um, our general fund is $169 million, and we provide 553 services um, in total to our residents. Um, we do a lot uh, of, of work uh, for them. So um, a little bit more about the data here that we're going to talk about. Um, the population of Kent County is distributed um, in a way that uh, the core six, so the six urban cities that we often call the core six, have 59% of um, our residents in our community, while the out county and the rest of it has 41%. Um, so we really went through and, and uh, verified this um, deeply. Um, and one thing we did differently um, looking at this is this is 2017 data. Um, the reason we did that is because we wanted, uh, we started this at the end of 2018 and we wanted a complete set of data. So 2017 was our year and we've used that throughout the report. So while we have more recent data now, um, when we started this we had 17 data and we felt like that would be a good way. So you'll see this is all 2017. Um, when we look at the general fund, though, of the $169 million, you'll see that property taxes only contribute 54% of our general fund. So when we talk about who gets what services and who pays what for services, I just think it's important to recognize that property taxes only make up 54%. We have intergovernmental revenues, we have charges for service, investments, transfers in. There's other resources that come into this general fund besides just property taxes. And of those 553 services, 278 are non-mandated, 275 are mandated. Remember, this county is a unique kind of government in Michigan where we get a number of mandates from the state that we have to provide on behalf of them. Um, and then we uh, supplement and add to those with those non-mandated services. Um, so. Just remember that as we go through, we're doing mandated things and we're doing non-mandated non things. So when we look at the taxable value of the general fund, you know, it was $21.8 billion um, in uh, 2017. Our operating levy uh, for the general tax levy was 42803 and that again contributed, that property tax levy contributed 54% of that general fund contribution. When we look at where that, re that, where that value comes from, that value is separated 50-50 between our out county areas and the core six. Population, if you remember, is 59-41. Um, uh, Funding for um, difference comes from the residential values out county, um, non-core six, are much higher than in the urban core six. Commercial property, there's much more commercial and industrial property in the core six. So when you look at where the revenues are coming from, the value of the revenues, 
values are situated differently depending on all kinds of different uh, circumstances. Location, 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 right? And what its purpose is for. So we're not, the value is a holistic measure, but you just have to recognize that it comes from different places to support these, these services. And when you look at what our operating levy is compared to the other urban counties in the state of Michigan, we're at the second lowest. We're at 4.202803. A fun fact, if you don't know, that I found fun at least, is that we are uh, the 80, we are the, have 85%, our mill set, our millage is set below 85% of the 83 counties in Michigan. 85, 83, it kind of has a good ring to it. And so we provide these 553 services um, with a really low um, general property tax millage. We're doing a lot of great things for our community um, in comparison to other counties and what their, their taxes are. And part of that is because of the value of our property. Um, again, just wanted to reiterate here, so the 91 million in property taxes and 50, we receive from that 54% of the general fund. So when we go into the delivery of services here, um, this is where the meat of what we're starting to talk about is um, in those provision of services, the mandated and the under, and unmandated services. So this is one of the big um, ahas to many of us in this report is this year we took our mandated service study that we do every few years and we had 30 different spreadsheets that created that information. And we created a database. We took all 30 of those data sets and we put them into one database and then we started doing um, connections with other data um, identifiers so we could start looking at funding. And what became clear to us is that through this process is that 97% of our mandated services are underfunded. Only 3% or seven services of our mandated services are fully funded at this time. Now, we do not know the scope of the underfunding. It could be a few dollars, could be a lot of dollars, and that's the next iteration of what we're gonna be doing is digging into that so that we can understand more how much we are having to subsidize, if you will, with the general property tax dollar, those services. So that is a huge finding of this report by doing the deeper analysis on the data um, dive that we did. So when we look at expenditures across the county and what we're spending our property tax money on, you can see a distribution chart here that's on page 17 of the report. Um, public safety is the largest um, uh, area at 36%, right? Um, and then we have general government, uh, judicial are two other large um, um, areas that we provide funding for. And then our transfers out is 20%. Transfers out is what we utilize to leverage state and federal resources for other grants. So when you look at that, um, that would help support the child care fund and the judicial court. It would help uh, the FOC, because there's a 33% match that we have with the federal government. That's what the transfers out equal to. It's a significant portion. So now we get to finally utilization, right? Who's using our services? Um, we took three, for the today's report uh, presentation, we took three kind of highlighted areas as a sample for you, and there's more information in the report. Um, but we looked at forward-facing services of public safety, judicial, and then um, some human services. So in terms of public safety, um, the corrections uh, budget in our public safety area is 59% of our general fund, uh, or of our general fund in public safety, it goes to that. Um, that also funds the, the uh, you can see there, road patrol, dispatch, and correct, um, uh, and work 911, there's a typo there, it should be 911 in the 3%. When we look at the, um, the booking distribution of who's, using, who's booking people at the jail, we have centralized booking in Kent County. Core six is 62% of the, are coming from the core six for the arrests that are booked at the jail. 28% um, come from the rural communities and then 10% are outside, you know, jurisdictions that bring people to the jail. 
Um, and when we look at um, victim representation and what the prosecutor does and how they represent victims and connect victim services, 66% um, of those, uh, those uh, individuals come from the core six city. And we provide about 4.4 million to the prosecutor's office for providing those services. Again, this is just a sample of the work that's in the report um, and you can find out more when you look. Um, our next area we wanted to talk a little bit about is human services. Um, we look at life skills participants. This is a program that the um, health department operates. There's grant funding to this program, but we also support it with general funding that transfers out. The rural communities um, utilize the services. So the rural school districts, the out county school districts utilize this service more so than their core six school districts. So you can see the distribution of what we're doing for outreach um, to, those, to those communities. There were 19,000 students that we touched in this program last year. Um, when we look at maternal infant health participants, this is a home visiting services that's funded by Medicaid, but it's also funded and subsidized by the general fund and our transfers out because Medicaid doesn't cover the full cost of the service. Um, you can see there that 73% of our clients rep are in the core six cities and 27% are in our more rural communities. We're providing services across the whole county but to different people based on their needs. And then we look at water and septic services. This service is clearly utilized by our rural participants much more than our urban participants. And why is that? Because we have city water and city sewer oftentimes in our core six. We have a more developed infrastructure, right? Again, we need to protect water across quality across the whole county. Um, our role in doing this is to work with the outer parts of our communities and to do that. Um, so this, again, is one of those areas where the more rural parts of our um, community use more services than the urban. So we wanted just to say in conclusion, you know, today, um, Kent County really does provide a significant number of mandated and, un and unmandated services. And depending on where people live, they use different services uh, because they have different needs. And our job is to provide services to our whole community based on those mandates and um, discretionary services that you decide upon. Um, one of the benefits of Kent County and other counties is that we're able to leverage significant investments across a broader region. So we have one booking center in Kent County instead of having multiple with each city having to create their own booking centers. We have one health department to protect water, sewer, instead of um, having uh, each municipality have their own um, health department. We get scale by doing that. Um, and then, you know, because we've done this again, we can really deep down, dive deep into the data to really start looking at like, of those mandated services, are we getting the funding we need from our state and federal partners <laughs> to really, uh, to meet the needs that they're telling us we have to do? And I think that's the big aha to this, this deeper dive that we did this year, is that we need to do even more examination and analysis on that because that is um, uh, a significant finding um, that you know, we, we now know that we are significantly underfunded. Um, and so now the question is we have to quantify how much. So, um, you know, we're happy to uh, answer questions about this. There's more information obviously in the report. Um, but uh, turn it over to you, Jim. Thank you, Matthew. I want to acknowledge it's pretty obvious that you, Jennifer, Mary Beth, and Mike did a ton of work. Um, you didn't have a lot of time to do it because we kept hounding you for it. Um, so I think kind of from my perspective, and I haven't had a chance to, to really like sift through a deep dive in the, in the, the larger report, but um, you know, I think this is a great starting point, especially with the data. And it, it makes me very encouraged to know that we're going to start really monitoring the data and looking universally at it and uniformly at it. So that's awesome. Any questions for Matthew? Commissioner Ponstein. Thank you, Chair Bolter. So you ended on the part about mandated services. What is the dollar amount if the state fully funded all of their mandates? That's exactly what we need to identify now, Commissioner. Um, the way the data was queued up is that um, we don't have that right now. We just know that it wasn't fully funded because of the way we track the data. 
when we go through the mandated study, there's a box that we check if it says underfunded, but we've never really gone through and quantified that underfunding. So now our job is to go back through that mandate study and really dig down with our um, departments to figure out what is the underfunding so that we can come back to you with more information um, to, to, to really say what it is. Um, because we had never combined those data sets together and we'd only looked at them in silos, we never really put all of it together to recognize like, oh my gosh, out of those mandated services, we only have 3% that are fully funded by the way we've checked boxes. As we take our action request to you, we go through and we look at full funding, underfunding. And so we've got to go back and do more analysis. Okay, then on page 10, yep. 20, well, there's two numbers. The one on the public safety utilization, just a clarification. When you use percentages, it's tough to get the real. So if you had a resident of Kent County that lived in township 10 and committed a crime in city number one, so that stat, does that go under outside of Kent County or because the six cities were the arresting people, do they get the credit for that crime? Well, that's it. So yeah, we looked at it both two ways. We looked at it as where the crime occurred and who the arresting agency is, but we also, I believe, in the report talked about where their home address was, um, because there's two different things. People can come from a rural area into the city, core six to commit a crime, and likewise, people from the core six can go out into a rural area to commit a crime. So you have to look at both um, to really get a sense, and that's why having one database and one large um, system. So off the top of my head, I don't have the number, but we'll get it for you because it, it, we did that analysis, and um, I will have to re refresh my exact memory of that. Commissioner Coleman. As the uh, census occurs, is that going to throw your data analysis off? Um, I don't think so. It's, we're just going to continue to you know, use census data as it is, and we'll evaluate how many people live in different communities right, and, and whatnot. Um, in this report, one of the improvements we made is the zip codes. Um, it's the easiest way to track data at this point. It's not the best way, though, um, because different zip codes change, the geography of zip codes change, and also there's more people in some zip codes than other zip codes, mm -hmm. so that's another um, issue. Um, and then previous reports we found out that uh, there's PO boxes, right? PO boxes have their own zip code. Um, so we took those out this year, um, so we were, uh, so we now have, a, I think, a more of a, a grounded methodology that we'll be able to repeat in future years. Commissioner Talon. Thank you, Chair. Great report, Matthew. I wanted to make sure I understand the definition that you were working with for underfunded, and then looking at page 7 where it says 97% of mandated services were underfunded. So if, for example, at the health department, a particular program is supposed to be a 50-50 split with the state, is that considered underfunded if the state is paying 50% or is it only considered underfunded if the state's paying 49% or less, sir? If it, the state would be paying anything less than 50%, it would be underfunded if they're not meeting their threshold of their commitment. So it's based on their, mm -hmm. okay, that helps, thank you. Commissioner Antor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Matthew, on the, uh, the infant health program, uh, see, we're, I think we're responsible back in 2017 for about one-third coming out of our general fund. How does the new first steps millage affect those numbers, and has that been considered for this report? Uh, the plan right now is that we've talked about that being additional money, not supplanting existing services. That was part of the discussion in the subcommittee. So I would anticipate that we'd still be working um, just as it is now. Um, I would say, though, that the health department years ago did a, a yeoman's job at decreasing their subsidy to that program. They really went back and analyzed how much they were subsidizing, and they've shrunk that over the years and become much more efficient through use of technology and other things. So um, 
I don't see the general fund getting replaced by the millage dollars at this point. Um, we're trying to grow capacity, and there's um, under there's more home visiting services that are needed. And we're not meeting the needs, so I would imagine that um, I wouldn't see that. But that doesn't mean that the health department won't continue to try to reduce the general fund subsidy to that program because they're trying always to get more efficient and effective in that. Commissioner Womack. How you doing, sir? Matt? Hey. Good morning. For the sake of condensing our general fund revenue for this diagram, I, I know a lot of this had to be truncated for us, but just not to leave much ambiguity for those who may be watching by video or here today from the public, could you give me a count of what some of those charges are that make up the 16.60% of our general fund revenue? Is it kind Marriage of licenses. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. Uh, marriage licenses would be an example of, of a fee for service that comes into the general fund birth certificate um, when people pay for a birth certificate, things like that. Yes, and so when we look at the 53.6% uh, property taxes and we talk about the property taxes, and then when you think of those charges that also come from the public, it, it just seems that our taxes would be more of a critical component. And, um, very important to our survival here um, and being financially responsible, uh, keeping our general fund balanced. And um, I know you said that our property taxes aren't the only place that money's coming from, but with that being 53% and intergovernmental being 15%, and uh, when you add those charges that are also coming from the public, I, I still believe that the taxpayers would be very, you know, that, that that tax base is very important to a healthy survival of our financials in the future. A little more than that was kind of explained. Yeah, it's very important. I just think some of us sometimes are surprised when we look at uh, it's just over 50% of the whole general fund. I mean, we get a lot of other revenues that come in from other, a lot of other services like you talked about. So revenue sharing is very important to us. Fees, all these things make it up. And if any part of it leaves, um, yeah, you know, it, it does cause alarm for all of us. So. That, that is very important. So I'm glad you did bring some attention to those other very important revenue uh, distribution points. Thank you, Matt. And Thank you for all the work you and your staff have done on this excellent presentation. Thank you. Commissioner Wooden. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good to see you, Matthew. And uh, this really is, uh, um, you know, uh, shows a lot of hard work. And read it last night. I'm excited to read it again this Memorial Day weekend. I'm sure that's exactly what my spouse would like me be, to be doing on Memorial Day weekend. But I'm going to be enjoying that. Um, I have a few questions. Um, the, uh, under, on page 13, on the provision of services, we categorize under the mandated services county functions performed as authorized by one or more resolutions of the Board of Commissioners. I was a little bit puzzled why we consider that a mandated service because we're not being told to do it, we're deciding to do it. That's the way I read it. Uh, could you provide a little more background as to why that's placed in that category? I'm looking on page 13 of the report, and you're talking about bullet point, um, the third bullet point, county functions performed as authorized by one or more of those resolutions? Yes. Yeah, so we're being told by you to do it. It's being a mandate to us. It's not state mandated, but county. County mandated. mandated. So this is a historical document. It has been the way we've categorized things over time. Um, doesn't mean we can't go back and think d more deeply about what the category should be, but for consistency, um, and then just for, so as many of you know, the county was one of the first county in the state to do this mandated, unmandated report, and has been, definitions have been utilized by other counties throughout the state. We were the first person, uh, first organization, excuse me, to do this years ago, and so we're kind of, the, our definitions have st stood the test of time and are now being used as the model for other counties. So I, before we would change it, I would, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the only reason I asked it was, you know, the way I saw it was, you know, non-mandated services are when we have a say. And the reason I stressed it was, you know, 
to me, our non-mandated services or our board-directed services are the truest statement of our, our values when it comes to appropriation. You know, budget, to my opinion, is a, is a statement of values. And so uh, that was the reason I, I was wondering why it was in the mandated category, not the non-mandated. I, I have a f another question this time um, on page 30 um, with the row patrol incidences, the 50-50 split between our rural communities and core six. Could we get more detail as to what is there a difference in incidences that are being responded to when it's a core six versus a rural community? Is it a traffic? I mean, I would imagine a traffic collision on 196 right by the sheriff's department. It would make sense to send a road patrol car out there. Um, but what's a more uh, more of a breakdown on what kind of incidences are being reported and what's the depth of the incident? Is it trading an email? Is it because there's a, a, an offender who is also uh, dealt with something with a road patrol, et cetera? We'll, we'll get that information for you. Thank you. Commissioner Steck. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Matthew. Uh, first of all, uh, a lot of work here, good, uh, good work, and, um, and as um, was indicated, we've got a lot of reading to do, so thank you for that. A uh, couple of things that come to mind as I'm looking at this. The first is, uh, as uh, Commissioner Talon identified, the, the underfunding just jumps out at you as you look at this, uh, that 93% that, uh, of our uh, mandated services or our services are underfunded. Uh, however, as I'm listening further, underfunded could be $1 underfunded, could qualify that as being uh, in that 93%. So I suppose theoretically we could have an underfunding that's uh, $278 when you add it all up. Not likely to be that number, but right. uh, so really let's not jump to any conclusions until we see the, the next level of that analysis as to what's the total dollars. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Uh, that's what we have to do to, so okay. we know the magnitude. Um, the, the other thing I'm looking at here is 54% um, of the GF comes from our tax revenue uh, and that tax revenue I think that the report's suggesting that approximately 50 percent of it comes from the rural areas as opposed to the urban areas and I understand the reason for that but uh, so 41 percent of our rural area our population comes from rural areas so um, uh, but that that can lead to a wrong conclusion candidates to whether or not 41 percent are paying 50 percent of the taxes but it really is related back to their property values of what they're holding Property values drive that as well as the millage rate. So, um, yeah. But this is one of the arguments that we heard, we have heard historically. So we try to lay it out so that it's there. But yeah, I you're got correct. It. Value is the uh, key. So the rural areas pay more 50 percent of the of the taxes for the services that are covered through the general fund. Um, which gets to my third point. To the extent that uh, this report begins to set the table for some uh, consideration or deliberation on whether or not our services are being equitably allocated between rural and urban, that's a very complex question. And the, and the uh, complexity and breadth of the services we provide, the revenues received, um, I, I'm almost uh, left concluding that uh, whatever discussions we have about that, uh, we'll, we'll land where we started with what we're looking for. Um, it, so I guess I just caution my colleagues that um, there's no easy answer to that uh, consideration. Uh, and even if we dig down deep through this, it's still not going to be an easy answer. Uh, it's going to be complex. Very complex, yes. Commissioner Skiggs. Thank you, Chair. Um, so um, thanks to, uh, to Jen and Mary Beth and, and Mike and Matthew. This is a, a fant fantastic report. Um, you know, I read it uh, recently uh, alongside the, the decades-old report, and um, I think there's uh, a lot to, uh, to learn and, and to see the improvements there. Um, and I certainly appreciate uh, some of you meeting with me on this issue. Uh, and I, you know, look forward to this kind of project and, and movement continuing on. Obviously, this is a report, and we have to put it in a, uh, a binder and, and give it nice colors. But uh, I hope that it doesn't uh, end up on a shelf, but becomes something that we can really use uh, as we think about uh, services uh, and policies. Um, you know, to me, one of the biggest things that 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 leaps out, um, which I think we all know. Um, 
is you know the amount of expenses that were that were incurring um, when dealing with the first three days of someone being sent to jail. Um, I think that that's really a place that we can you know, work with our partners in in the cities and the sheriff department to see if there are ways to uh, to move more towards an appearance ticket um, uh, policy uh, on low level crimes um, as opposed to a booking policy at the jail. Um, you know, I, 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 I will look forward to taking a deeper dive into this. I think it's really important as we look about where the money is going um, to do that division into what's coming from our residents uh, directly through the fees, through the property taxes, uh, and then what's being funneled through through the state and the feds um, so that we can, in all its complexity, work for um, really true fairness and delivery of services um, across all jurisdictions and all clumps of jurisdictions uh, to make sure that everyone in this county um, can clearly uh, understand and, and believe and have it be true um, that this is a, a county government that's really uh, fair and functioning well for everyone. Thanks. Any other questions? C Commissioner Wooden. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, for the opportunity to speak a second time. Um, yeah, I mean, concluding from my perspective after reading this, you know, one of the things I just think to ensure that this does not become a report that stands on a shelf is, you know, posing that question that when, when there may be a service that is not federally or state mandated and funded, uh, even underfunded, um, we should be evaluating how we can make that as available as possible. You know, whether that's making intergovernmental agreements available to every community within our jurisdiction, much like our, our delinquent tax revolving fund, um, taking steps to ensure that when we're trying to create regional parks and engaging the entire region to ensure that they're actually being used as such. Uh, and just really excited to see some of the data that's in this report. Uh, excited to read it again. And, and again, thank you for the work. And, and just on a final note, uh, with all due respect, Commissioner Skaggs, I was your intern 10 years ago. I don't plan to be it again. <laughs> all right, Commissioner Bukowski. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to uh, repeat my tirade on Tuesday about borrowed federal money, so you can watch that video if you would like. Um, however, you know, with Commissioner Stack, Commissioner Skaggs, others talk about all these strings are attached. Um, so it's like we go to Lansing and we demand make, you know, $10 million more. Well, they're just going to get it from us anyways. Lansing has some fee for service, but it's our money. Washington, I'll leave it there. Um, so, so again, all strings are attached. What's really equity across the state, across the nation? We definitely have to look at those issues. At the same time, be careful what we ask for. And, but again, I want to keep, keep focused on it, but all politics is local, all taxation is local. Commissioner Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's like deja vu all over again. In uh, 2008, uh, we did a uh, per diem, jail per diem study, and we recommended that we that they should be writing more appearance tickets. I don't know where that's gone, but that recommendation was made back in 2008. So I want to go to page 26, and maybe you can help me understand this pie chart. I understand the correction detention millage is 41%. The jail per diem, I understand. I didn't know it was one percent, but the general fund is forty-six percent, and that includes not only tax dollars but other uh, other funding that you may receive. In that, um, if I could get that, if there's any way to break down the other fees that may be in that component of forty-six percent, but then you have other fees broken out, and I'm just wondering what that would entail. I would imagine commissary, telephones, other fees like that uh, are sometimes charged or associated with incarceration. So okay. we'll, we can dig deeper into that. Any other questions for Matthew? Commissioner Antor. Not a question, Matthew. Just a comment. You know, I represent three townships where we have tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of acres of ag land that um, everybody pays their taxes on and they require very few if any services throughout the years when you stop and think about it so 
Um, I think the urban area is kicking in their fair share. We don't require a lot in exchange for that, and I think it's a pretty good deal for the county. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I just have one question and one suggestion. I wondered if the special millage, the property millages, are included in this or no? No, those are okay. Those so are special and outside of the general. Maybe fund. we could add that for contribution um, apportionment for next time, and then I would encourage us, and it's obviously up to our board, but if we can take that underfunding a step further and list it out with how much we're underfunded because I think that would really greatly contribute to our legislative priorities. I mean, if there's something glaringly horrible or, um, you know, we're really underfunded, I think we really need to take a look at that. And, and our representatives at MAC need to take that to MAC and, and maybe, like I said, like you said, we lead in a lot of these things and maybe other counties need to do this same analysis to see where we're grossly underfunded. So thank you for all your work again. Really, really appreciate it. All right, we are on to item six, public comment for related issues to the agenda. Are there any, any anyone in here wanting to speak on agenda items from the public? All right, seeing none, on to item seven, consent agenda, and I'll call on Commissioner Voorhees. Uh, Madam Chair, I would move uh, the passage of the consent agenda. Moved by Commissioner Voorhees, support, support by Commissioner Coleman. Madam Chair, will you please call the er, <laughs> Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Thank you, Madam Chair. On the motion to adopt the consent agenda, Commissioners Antor. Yes. Breevy. Yes. Bulkowski. Yes. Hennessy. Yes. Jones. Yes. Coleman. Yes. Melton. Morgan. Yes. Ponstein. Yes. Salfeld. Yes. Skaggs. Yes. Sparks. Yes. Vice Chair Steck. Yes. Commissioners Talon. Yes. Vonk. Yes. Voorhees. Yes. Womack. Yes. Wooden. Yes. Chair Bolter. Yes. Madam Chair, <clears throat> you have 18 yeas, zero nays. The motion passes. The consent agenda is adopted. Thank you, Madam Clerk. On to resolutions. Item 8 on the agenda. I will call on Commissioner Wooden for <laughs> resolution A. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move uh, adoption of resolution 44 of today's date to approve the Kent County Community Development uh, Annual Action Plan and Appropriation through Kent County Community Action. Moved by Commissioner Wooden. Support by Commissioner Sparks. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Thank you, Madam Chair. On the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Are there any questions or comments? <laughs> Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Chair. I just want to comment that I will be abstaining on this one due to a potential conflict with my day job, which happens. Thanks. Any other questions or comments on this resolution? All right. Now, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. On the motion to adopt resolution 523-1944, Commissioners Antor. Yes. Breevy. Yes. Bulkowski. Yes. Hennessy. Yes. Jones. Abstain. Coleman. Yes. Melton. Morgan. Yes. Ponstein. Yes. Salfeld. Yes. Skaggs. Yes. Sparks. Yes. Vice Chair Steck. Yes. Commissioners Talon. Yes. Fonk. Yes. Voorhees. Yes. Womack. Yes. Wooden. Yes. Chair Bolter. Yes. Madam Chair, you have 17 yeas, one abstention, zero nays. The motion passes. Resolution 523-1944 is adopted. Thank you, Madam Clerk. On to Resolution B. I'll call on Commissioner Breevy. Thank you, Chair. I move to approve Resolution 45, approval of the Kent County Community Action City of Grand Rapids Annual Operations Funding from Kent County Community Action. Moved by Commissioner Breevy. Support. Support by Commissioner Wooden. Any questions or comments? Commissioner Steck. Thank you, Chair. Just a uh, question for those of us that sit on the KCCA board. Uh, are we required to abstain from this? I don't think so. No. Any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. On the motion to adopt Resolution 523-1945, Commissioners Antor. Yes. Breevy. Yes. Volkowski. Yes. Hennessy. Yes. Jones. Yes. Coleman. Yes. Melton. Morgan. Yes. Ponstein. Yes. Salfeld. Yes. 
Skaggs. Yes. Sparks. Yes. Vice Chair Steck. Yes. Commissioners Talon. Yes. Vonk. Yes. Voorhees. Yes. Womack. Yes. Wooden. Yes. Chair Bolter. Yes. Madam Chair, you have 18 yeas, zero nays. The motion passes. Resolution 5, 23, 1945 is adopted. Thank you, Madam Clerk. On to resolution sub C, I call on Commissioner Voorhees. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my honor to move. Resolution 46 of today's date comes from the case management for our capital improvement project supplemental appropriation for the prosecuting attorney's office. Moved by Commissioner Voorhees. Support by Support. Commissioner Morgan. Any questions or comments? All right, seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. On the motion to adopt Resolution 523-1946, Commissioners Antor. Yes. Breeby. Yes. Volkowski. Yes. Hennessy. Yes. Jones. Yes. Coleman. Yes. Melton. Morgan. Yes. Ponstein. Yes. Salfeld. Uh, yes. Skaggs. Yes. Sparks. Yes. Vice Chair Steck. Yes. Commissioners Talon. Yes. Vonk. Yes. Voorhees. Yes. Womack. Yes. Wooden. Yes. Chair Bolter. Yes. Madam Chair, you have 18 yeas, zero nays. The motion passes. Resolution 523-1946 is adopted. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We are on to agenda item nine, public comment unrelated or just generally related to county matters unrelated to the agenda. Anyone wishing to speak today? Drain Commissioner Yonker, come on up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, commissioners, I'm here to bring your attention to a certain piece of legislation that is now starting to be pushed through the system in Lansing. I have some copies with the clerk. You can look at it deeper if you want. It's not a big, it's not a big complex rewrite, but it is going to have large implications. It's going to affect me and you. All right, moving forward. It's Senate Bill number 185. This is being presented by Senator Stamas from the Midland area. And what it does is it takes my ability as an elected drain commissioner away from making first emergency decisions on a drain to, to correct an issue that is causing harm to the general public. I would have to, under this bill, come before you for approval to act in an emergency situation. All right? That's a, big, that's a big deal. I deal with this at least three, four a year. One currently one is where we're waiting for the legal process to go through to, to repair a drain that's plugged, that's collapsed, it's backing up water. As a result, a uh, residential driveway was totally uh, filled up with water because water couldn't flow. So the, the property owner's driving out of his driveway over a pipe down into the mud because it turned into a big soup hole. So he can't use his driveway. I have until the end of the month. This was a month ago before I can actually do the work. I could declare an emergency situation to do a section of that contract and get his driveway back. If this law takes place, then I have to come before you. You would have to educate yourself on the issue and give me permission to act. In the meantime, the property owner doesn't get served. Big problem. The other thing it does is it, um, it goes through and says that if we do maintenance on a, on a drain and there's, and there's a, a assessment that's in place, we cannot go back and do any more work in that drain unless you approve that work. So how does that play out? And one example, Byron Center has a lot of, a third of our drains is in Byron Center. And they have a lot of trees over their drains. Last year we went through and we cleared out about five miles of trees because you couldn't even see the water. That's how bad it's been. And so then two weeks after we did that, we had a straight line wind come through there. Half of that drain was replugged. According to this, I can't go back in there until that assessment's paid, which usually is two to three years. We have drains that have invasive grasses that grow in them. And every two years, those drains are cluttered back because of these grasses. Under this, and, and those assessments are two to three years. I mean, it's not cheap. 
So we try to make it convenient for the property owner. But now I can't go in to do this without you saying I can do it. This is a real cumbersome pro process for an elected official, myself, that has to serve the people and give them the service they're paying me to do. And so what I'm asking is you pay attention to this, talk to your state representatives. We have to stop this thing in the Senate. We don't want this leaving committee in the Senate. I will be lobbying. A lot of my colleagues I served with in the House are in the Senate, and they will definitely know what this is going to do to us. And it's all because of one bad commissioner in Midland that definitely should be removed from office, under my opinion. He has done some gross misconduct in his service and has caused those poor people over there millions and millions of dollars of damage. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate your thank update. You. And I, I had asked our drain commissioner to give us this update. So thanks for coming in. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Any other public comment today? Come on up. Please give us your name and address. You have three good, minutes. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Wesley Watson. I'm a resident of Ada. Um, I'm here today. I'm the regional organized director for Next Gen uh, Michigan, which is a youth advocacy program that focuses on uh, leveraging youth needs and taking that to elected officials and trying to create policies uh, intersectionality policies that helps all of our youth. Some of our main focuses that we're going to be focusing on is voter, voters' right issues, um, especially after Prop 3 has passed. Uh, working with college students here in our county on what ways can we make their life a little easier uh, with no application, absentee voting, um, also with uh, same-day uh, voters' registration. So we just had an election. Uh, a couple weeks ago, and about 50% 50, 50 of the um, same-day voters' registrations all came from youth between the age range of 18 to 20. So um, I'm here giving an open invitation to you guys. Uh, we will be throwing an event on Juneteenth um, at 4 o'clock, so that's June 19th, at Link Up, and it's going to be a listening session of what ways, how, how can we improve voting, voting rights for our youth in our community. Um, we're going to be working with Grand Valley, and we're going to be working with the city of Grand Rapids, and it's an open invitation to the county officials to come out, uh, seeing what ways how we can um, advocate for the youth within you guys' this district. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome to Kent County Board. <laughs> All right, any other public comment today? Seeing none, we are on to item 10 of the agenda, Commissioner Reports. Any reports today? Commissioner Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I mentioned this at the Finance Committee, but uh, I have sent out a list of ongoing CIP projects at the airport. Uh, Pam is so kind to do that for me. Um, expect that. Um, Ted's juggling about $55 million worth of projects out there that are ongoing. That doesn't include um, our vision of expansion of uh, Concourse A at this point, but as of now, there's about $55 million worth of projects ongoing. Thank you, Commissioner Morgan. Commissioner Jones? Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to let everyone know I was at the supervisors' meeting, and they had a presentation uh, from Lance from KDL, and that they appreciated the state of the county, and there is a, a future opportunity to connect with the Board of Commissioners coming up that Mandy uh, has been spearheading which I think they also uh, appreciate so I think continued communication with them and us and connection is appreciated and then Emily and I can do this together but we both went to the West Michigan Sports Commission luncheon we're both on the West Michigan Sports <coughs> Commission board and they had uh, Kirk Gibson and Alan Trammell as the keynote speakers and Lance Parrish was also present. So I'm still a little starstruck from the week, but they uh, had great attendance and we appreciate the other commissioners. Thank you, Commissioner Voorhees for participating and hosting. So it's, uh, it, it's another organization that really puts those heads in beds. And I just think we have to continue to recognize that and what a great asset to our community to have them. Plus, if you want to participate, you can participate in events. So feel free to sign up for the uh, state games. Commissioner Breeby. 
Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to give a brief update on the Grand Rapids Public Museum. And um, recently we had the Collections and Cocktails event and over $150,000 was raised to um, help restore some artifacts. And one of the big things they're focusing on is the carousel. So you're gonna see some repairs in the carousel um, coming up here in the near, near future. And recently you also received um, a report, I think it was sent to your homes, a community engagement report. And if you have not, I have an electronic copy I'd be happy to share with you. So just a brief update. If you have any questions about what's going on, there's all kinds of events happening this summer, and you'll see some things happening outside as well. So thanks. Any other reports today? Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Wilmack. Yes, I'm, I'm a member of the Network 180 board. Very proud to be a part of that, being a voice for the community, but at the same time learning a whole lot. And we had a meeting this week about some consolidated services that may come under Network 180. Uh, and um, the main point of that meeting was about some of the care providers for some of our citizens with learning disabilities and basically making sure that we are within the law and those regulations. But it became a very contentious meeting at sometimes. But our vice chair here, Mr. Steck, <laughs> Commissioner Steck, does chair that board. And I just want to say he did a great job uh, with the presentation. And by the end of the meeting, everybody understood what we had to do to make sure that we were within legal standards for the federal government and state government. And it was a great meeting. And some great services that will be consolidated and continue the care service that we need for those those disabilities. Great. Any other official reports today? All right, I have one. Um, we get to appoint two commissioners to the Early Childhood Education Review Committee, and that will be modeled after the Senior Millage Review Committee. Um, I kind of took into consideration desire and who really wanted to serve and also um, workload and who can really dig in and participate. So um, with that, I will be appointing Commissioner Skaggs and Commissioner Sparks to, to that review committee. And uh, we also are gonna hope to have a meeting, an organizational meeting where you can meet uh, hopefully with Carol and Commissioner Steck to kind of talk about how the senior millage is, is um, is structured so that we can definitely model that after that. So I wanted to make that announcement and we will move on to miscellaneous item 11. Any miscellaneous? Commissioner Ponstein. I'm the only one, so I think I'm the only one <laughs> <laughs> No, it does not. <laughs> uh, I think uh, Commissioner Brevi had mentioned that there's a lot of events going on this time of year, and there are, and we're blessed with so many nonprofits out there that hold fundraisers. Just wanted to point out a couple of them that probably are off the radar of a lot of you. Um, first of all, the zoo night for members, they're showing appreciation night if you're a member of the zoo. Uh, and I think the staff wants to show their support for your membership over these years. Uh, this weekend, there's an organization called the Well House that builds houses for homeless people. They've teamed up with Urban Roots. It's their annual plant sale. What's kind of unique about it is that the homeless people that <coughs> they're serving start these starter plants and then sell them, and the money stays with, stays with that person. So that's, like I said, Friday and Saturday. <coughs> and then moving to next week, uh, the folks at the Spokes folks are having a fundraiser. They are an organization that wants to get bicycling and cycling throughout, not just the Kent County area, but West Michigan. But they target areas of lower income. Uh, it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. If bicycling is an option to get you to and from your work, they want to make it as easy as possible. So I appreciate all their efforts on that. And then finally, just kind of a request for some more information, maybe Wayman. Um, people are still dying from the opioid crisis. Well, one thing we do good in this country, we go from one crisis after another. Uh, I don't see this ending. Uh, I know the coroner was at the legislative meeting a few months ago and he had mentioned that there's a growing cost to his department when people overdose on a drug, they take them to the nearest hospital. And when we're in a city that has a regional hospital, we get a lot of people coming in there from other counties. And then we, not in all cases, uh, should take that burden of the cost of that autopsy and the relating results. And I was just wondering if there, 
if the coroner could give us an update, is that trend still moving, that it's an ongoing, continued increase in cost, and uh, what, if anything, and, and, I, and I guess my main concern is with all the, some counties, some states are already settling with these drug companies, is that I think that that's something that should be at the top of the list, that the people that are performing these things should be at least reimbursed uh, through any type of legal actions. We'd love to do that. Commissioner, and we will provide an update. We'll also include information from our legal counsel as, as we are involved with the uh, legal actions uh, that other counties are as well. So we'll bring a comprehensive update back to you. Yep, and, I, and I did it this way. Instead of me sending a personal email and getting a response, I think it's an issue that uh, all 18, 19, including me, uh, have that information because I think it's going to be an ongoing uh, issue going forward. Commissioner Womack. Yes, I'd just like to thank my language interpreters for attending today's meeting. I also would say, given the substantial fund balance and healthy AAA bond rating that we have, I'm very happy to hear that today. And that gives us a chance to look at new initiatives as we move on throughout the year for a lot of great things for the county and um, better relations to uh, even putting our message out to the rural areas, the communities. Um, sometimes when I am visiting in some of the rural areas, I do get a chance to talk to our, some of our constituents that, that may not even be on the internet as much or in some of the news that gets to hit the six cities. So there's just a, a chance for us to connect with people all throughout Kent County. And I look forward to uh, talking to some commissioners about some of those initiatives for urban areas and rural areas. Great, Commissioner Steck. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I was fortunate enough this week with some of my other commissioners to attend an event for the Sheldon House that they put on. Commissioner Melton, uh, who was here, uh, emceed that event it was it was very nice it's it's always good uh, for those of us that spend a lot of time struggling with the process and the budgets and the organizations in the uh, community mental health area to actually get down and see some of these agencies that are are doing such great work in our communities um, and this is one of them so they're to be acknowledged for all of their hard work thank you commissioner antor thank you ma'am chair yeah, I'd like to you know, just agree with um, Commissioner Ponstein on his uh, talk about the opioid crisis and the medical examiner. Um, you know, obviously he's said it over and over that we have a crisis here. Um, the problem is we have a black market and 90% of the heroin and fentanyl is coming through at an area that we refuse to call it a crisis point for some reason. Um, so it's just it flies in the face of you know um, what's really going on out there so this stuff's entering the country and it is a crisis so if it's a crisis up here i guarantee it's a crisis where it's coming in from so i hope we can deal with that effectively thank you commissioner hennessy The oh, uh, thank you on may 30th the traditional um, memorial day there will be a parade in a ceremony at Veterans Park, and we have all received invitations to it. And I know that I will be on the back of a motorcycle driven by Commissioner Vonk. So uh, we will have it balanced. We'll go to the left and we'll go to the right. <laughs> but the sheriff has given me a get out of jail free card yeah. <laughs> um, if anyone would you know would like to participate with us in that we would welcome you i've touched base with a few of you personally to see if you're going to but it was after world war one um, the day was expanded to honor those who died in all american wars and in 1971 memorial day was declared a national holiday um, to be celebrated on the last monday in may and then again on the traditional May 30th this year. Um, so it, it is a day to honor and keep afresh the memory of all service women and men who have fallen in the line of duty defending and protecting the freedoms uniquely enjoyed by all citizens of this great democracy. So it is a weekend and a week that we will keep our fallen heroes in mind. Any other miscellaneous today? 
I just have one kind of in, in line with it. I uh, was able to join Senator Brinks and Mayor Bliss and, and the governor and many of our legislators uh, earlier in the, actually I think it was last week, um, for the groundbreaking of the new veterans home. And uh, that's something that I worked on a lot in the legislature. I know a lot of my colleagues did. I know all of our uh, local legislators have really worked very hard on it. And one person that um, didn't get much acknowledgement there was uh, Senator Hildenbrand, who was our appropriations chair at the time. And he did a lot of work to secure those that funding. So I just wanted to mention that as well. If uh, there is no other miscellaneous, I will call on Commissioner Voorhees for adjournment. <laughs> <laughs> We get used to our neighbors not doing the buttons for us. Uh, Just read. Madam Just Chair, read. I'd love to move uh, the uh, motion to adjourn, subject to the call of the chair, to Thursday, June 13, 2019, at 8.30 a.m. for an official meeting. Or moved by Commissioner Voorhees, support by Commissioner Morgan. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Morgan. Motion passes. We are adjourned. Kent County. I am Kent County. I am Kent County. We are Kent, Kent County. County. We are Kent 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 County. Bayah, Kent County. Ami, Kent County. Somos, Kent County. Mas Ira, Kent County. We, we are, are Kent, Kent County. County. We, we are, are Kent, Kent County. County. We are Kent County. Oh yeah.